Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us today to stay curious. Today we've got Mr. Nick Thomas with us. Hello, Nick. Good to see you again, Mark. Good to see you, Nick. Of course, Nick is the chief educator for Delaware North Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex. And Marty, my cameraman, co-producer. Hello, Marty. Busy. Yeah, he's busy. <laughs> We're, we, uh, we, uh, we are, uh, I, I mentioned Marty. Uh, we're into like our 400, and, no, 800 in the uh, episode of Stay Curious, four years of this, and we've enjoyed Nick coming on our program and giving us some of the behind the scenes doings as the astronaut wrangler out to Space Center, and he just does more than that. You're involved with a lot of things out there, but uh, today we've got a great show on two missions that were launched on the same day, mm -hmm. GT4 and GT nine and this is a picture that the great gene cernan took of the gemini 9a spacecraft mm -hmm, right and uh so we're gonna have a good time today i did uh, nick how you been you said you've just been a little bit with a yeah a little respiratory under the weather thing, but... and uh it kind of rebounded on me but i think i'm back to the good and i'm scheduled to be back on base tomorrow so looking forward to getting back to work well, we've been out there uh, numerous times, and you haven't been out there. Mark and as, as uh, Mark Smith's been doing the duties, and uh, had somebody another day out there. I forget who that was, but Richard. who? Rich. Richard. Oh, Richard. Mm -hmm. Yes, and yeah. so Marty's been going out there getting autographs. We really enjoy talking to the astronauts. I think the local people that go out there really uh, uh, realize what terrific people they are and, and the time they give nick you mm -hmm. really put them through the ringer out there i mean not the ringer but they're busy from nine o'clock yeah. when they step on that property till they leave at six i can yeah, tell except for lunchtime we basically have 15 minutes between events and that's 15 minutes to get back to the office recompress check the mail in case something's come up and then on to the next event so yeah they lead a they lead a pretty fast well i'm glad you check your mail that. once in a while i'm throwing you a birthday out there some of our <laughs> yep, wonderful yep. astronauts and, all those. and i know that you like saying hi to them mm -hmm. wanted to mention that nick won the coveted harry colcomb news and communications award uh a few years ago at the national space club of florida that was quite an honor i'm sure yeah it really was uh i was called into a conference at work uh, ostensibly about dying with an astronaut and it was only there that I was told uh, we got a phone call coming in and it was from uh, from my boss Theron Prozzi congratulating me on receiving this award and so I was caught completely flat-footed hmm. by it which is the best way to do those things well like you were your Snoopy award when they gave that to you yeah, and absolutely and we've talked about that and Nick we the museum really appreciates how you support us by coming on once a month and giving us some behind the scenes so of uh, uh, some of your experience with the Mercury and Gemini astronauts that my gosh there's just a handful of them left yeah. I mean the all the Mercury guys are gone and most of the people from that program too mm -hmm. yeah so uh so we're here to keep the dream alive wanted to show a picture of nick here let's go forward there I marty to reset it. i'm sorry pardon me i forgot to reset it back to oh okay that's all right we're on the fly here we had some technical problems getting off the air again here today but here we've got um we wanted to show let's go see. I'm, I'm going okay. forward oh there we go which way oh there yeah there's uh nick oh. with uh, I saw that as a great picture. Yeah, Susan, Don Thomas, Susan, Susan Kilrain. Kilrain, and Susan incidentally is about to, or may even even now be in the process of climbing the uh, uh, the the mountain in Africa. Uh, Kilimanjaro. Kilimanjaro, yeah. Wow. Yeah. She and her daughter are going out there to climb Kilimanjaro. So. Okay, we're gonna move the mic a little bit closer to you there. Uh, I've asked her to send me an email when she when she has uh, made the, the summit. There you go. Hey, if, in fact, I don't know if I no, put that. Okay. Uh, she was twice a pilot, could have been mm -hmm. a commander, mm -hmm. but why wasn't she a commander? She has a very good reason. Yeah, uh, she assessed her life after that second flight after STS ninety four, and she realized they had kids. And she was an astronaut, and her husband was a Navy SEAL, and it just wasn't fair to the kids to have both parents in high-risk endeavors like that. So Susan uh, then turned her attention toward being a full-time mom, which she just absolutely loves. And she is 
taking those kids, literally taking those kids to places around the world where they've been able to see the places where history has happened. And those kids, God bless them, have had the best education you could ever hope to have mm. uh, growing up. So uh, she's a remarkable woman. And she was asked one time during a show, were you ever scared? And she said the only thing that ever frightened her was a possibility that someone on the ground might play Wake Up Little Susie for her wake-up call. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's, that's so good. the only thing that scared her. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Of course, uh, Don Thomas there uh, uh, in Ohio mm -hmm. not. Of course, oh, me yeah. being from Ohio. And, and Don, I think Don does like 200 dates a year oh, in schools yeah, he's and constantly stuff. on the move yeah and of course he flew on 8394 with susan so they have that uh that connection and uh don you know just aside from all that is just an incredibly wonderful guy and uh uh I sometimes i'll sometimes refer to him as don tomas don tomas yeah uh, spanish prince but uh yeah, he's a great guy. Oh, he's just wonderful, he, wonderful to work with. And he's one of the hardest working retired oh, yeah. astronauts right. out there, along with uh, our good friend Nicole Stott and, and I, others out there. I, just doing I think that. he's like the Bob Hope of the astronauts. He's always on the road. So. Yeah, that's right. The Bob Hope of the astronauts there. Uh, well, there's a launch that we're grateful to Carlton Bailey. Thank you, CB, for sh uh, sending me this picture. That was the uh, Starlinks launch yesterday. Mm -hmm. Uh, beautiful launch today. They launched uh, on time. The crew, uh, CRS, uh, CRS supplies going to the space station. We'll dock tomorrow morning. Um, and boy, that thing shot in the clouds real quick today. I didn't yeah. get a good look at it. <clears throat> well, Wendy Lawrence and I were here. We're over at the hotel to watch Peggy Whitson's launch. Uh huh. And uh, of course, you know, she and Peggy are very close, so she wanted to make a point of being here for that launch. And we were watching the launch, and I had my camera, and I told Wendy, I said, turn around and smile. So she turned and smiled, and I got a couple of pictures of her there in the foreground with the rocket in the background. She's oh, going to send those to Peggy. Love to see that. Yeah. We've been we've been using, uh, we've been alerting our Stay Curious listeners that you were going to be on all last week today. Mm -hmm. So I've been using a picture of you and, and Wendy Lawrence mm -hmm. uh, that was taken in front of the Artemis rocket out right. there yeah. last year. Yeah. So. Uh, enjoy that and I know she's a good friend of yours and hope that Wendy's watching this program today as we're going to get kicked off with two tremendous Gemini missions that uh, uh, involve spacewalks before we do that we just, oh what did that that went there okay all right there we're there we are yeah. we did we want to remind you all Marty that didn't pop up and I don't think I took it out um Today's the last day to vote Gene Cernan on a beer can, care of Chris Kelly's artwork. And we've been promoting that. His uh, Gene Cernan, Last Man on the Moon, uh, is leading a beer company, uh, Nick, in New England called Two Rivers. That, uh, And if he gets the most votes, he will go in a competition to have this on a beer can. Well, it's so. a better image I can think of has been put on some beer can. So we'll leave it at that. <laughs> That's exactly right. Well, I'm going to give you the floor, my friend, and you tell us a little bit about these two two friends and, and awesome astronauts as we kick off our tribute to Gemini 4 and Gemini 9, launched on the same date, June 3rd, a year apart, 1965 and 66. Well, here we have the crew of Gemini 4, uh, Ed White on your left and Commander Jim McDivitt on your right. McDivitt and White, both members of the second group of astronauts, and McDivitt, one of only three astronauts from that group who were given a command on their first flight. Mm -hmm. There was McDivitt, there was uh, uh, Frank Borman, and then, of course, Neil Armstrong. So this crew was selected originally. It's important to remember the original primary mission objective on this flight was a long-duration mission. We were going to be up there for four days. It was going to be the first multi-day American manned space flight. Um, just before Gemini 3, Alexei Leonov uh, walked in space, and NASA realized that at some point or another we were going to have to do the same thing. And it was they looked into the tea leaves and they said Gemini 4 was going to be the first chance that they would have for an EVA since it was going to be four days in duration. So they very quietly trained for that possibility, but never said anything about it publicly until about two weeks before the mission when it was publicly announced that we were going to do a spacewalk on uh, on Gemini 4. 
This was also uh, going to be the first attempt at a rendezvous. They were going to try to rendezvous with the second stage of the Titan rocket, something mm -hmm. which did not really go well. We started to learn the immutable laws of uh, orbital rendezvous mechanics on that one. Uh, it would also be the first flight control from the new manned spacecraft center in Houston, Texas. And this was also the first international live broadcast of an American manned space launch. So there's several very important and some subsidiary first to this uh, mission that make it uh, uh, very, very exciting. Of course, the EVA, the spacewalk being the, the first. Uh, that spacewalk was originally going to be on the second orbit, but they had gotten so tied up with this attempt to rendezvous with the Titan second stage that they decided to defer until the third orbit. Uh, of course, driving toward that Titan second stage, Jim McDivitt pointed the nose, fired the aft thrusters to go toward it, but as a result, it just got further and further away. We we're learning then about the proper way to perform orbital rendezvous mechanics, and it was not going to be a straightforward uh, uh, operation. In any event, as I say, we, um, we deferred that EVA to the uh, third orbit, and um, during the spacewalk, as people have listened to the uh, air to ground on that spacewalk, they've heard the problems with the communications. Uh, the, uh, the astronauts, uh, or the ground could hear the astronauts, the astronauts couldn't hear the ground. And all that was a result of having used the uh, new Vox mode, the voice actuated circuit, and this kind of tangled up the communications and they really didn't solve it until uh, close to the end of the uh, spacewalk when they finally established contact and Chris Kraft told the uh, crew that uh, Ed had to get back into the uh, into the vehicle. I think we've got some uh, images of Yeah, we've got that. Marty is asking if you can move the image in between Nick and I oh, there. Oh, sorry. Okay, in there, since it's off Nick's head there, we got that space in the middle there. I'm sorry. And uh, the pictures are actually going backwards. Uh, on this well, so, uh, yeah. yeah we're just this is just a I'm looking for one the of the weirder days of, today there you go there we go there's our, yeah now we're moving forward there's okay. there's All a right. woman who was part of every uh launch day in mercury gemini uh 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 uh, 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 uh what would you call it uh almost an icon of the o'hara yeah the o'hara uh, lieutenant in the united states air force she was the astronaut's nurse and I think also medical confidant and things of that nature. So she always took care of her crews. Uh, she was a member of the team as much as any flight director or, or, or uh, mission controller and so forth. She was just an integral part of the, uh, of the program and a wonderful mm, ongoing tradition on launch days mm -hmm. for the crews. And had confidence of these men that, yeah. that whatever their medical conditions or whatever Absolutely. she was going to, and she's never written a book. Nope, nope. And uh, she's and still you, alive. I think she's around 87 years old. And, you know, her, her services to the program extend to the fact that during Project Mercury, she did all the design of the crew quarters. She had, had them painted that robin eggs, uh, robin's egg blue, huh. and she oversaw all that and all the amenities of the crew quarters. And she was basically, uh, I don't want to call her a den mother because that, uh, that doesn't really uh, properly encompass all the things she did for the, for the teams and for the crews. But yeah. uh, she was, um, she was, she was. Uh, no, very, very yeah. involved. And we, we honor her in yeah. the, uh, uh, in our women's gallery there. So yeah. Marty put yeah. up the sign, don't touch the keys. Did you see a, a flicker, Marty? Yeah, I got a cursor. Okay, so what we what we have going on here, Nick, is our computer gets a little lag behind, yeah. and Marty will tell us when uh, when when we can uh, advance the pictures here. It doesn't stop what we're talking about here today, Nick. But I want you to know that we've got a lady, Des Desalin Zerga, is watching from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh -huh. We we got that we had some people that when we posted you're going to be on today, they said, hey. You know, we're looking forward to it. Uh, we've got Ethiopia is going to watch. Wow. We've got Edward Peaks in Melbourne, uh -huh. uh, down the road here, not Australia, Melbourne, Florida. Craig Donaldson is the deputy mayor of Williamsville, New York. Wow. Glad that you're watching, Craig. Mm -hmm. Davis Sherman's watching. Giuseppe Don Vita 
said he'd be watching from Bari, Italy today. Oh, Italy, very yeah, good. Right? Very good. And William Whiting, he's up there in Michigan. Go Green, uh, the Spartans is his uh, team up there, Michigan Spartans. And Mary Folsom, not too far from here, Marty. Mary said she'd be watching today. So, And if any of my friends from the Alenia Aerospace Corporation in Torino are watching, hello, and Dr. Carlo Bonapati and his team out there, hope you're doing well. Great, great. Marty, can we advance? Yep. Okay. Well, tell us a little bit about Nick here as we're going to look at the food that they took with yeah. us on that there, and then we'll show that slide when we're yeah, Of course, the food became a very critical factor now that we're going to uh, be up in orbit for four days. And uh, it was, as, as we know, the advent of these rehydratable foods. And you had the little water gun in the Gemini spacecraft, and you plugged it into the bag, and you squirt in so many ounces of water and you needed the food together and uh, at that time during Gemini we did not have hot water on board the spacecraft so everything was going to be cold um, and uh, you also had these uh, heavy for some strange reason these heavy-duty surgical scissors that were going to be used to cut the bags open it was really overkill hmm. but if we get to that picture i'll i'll point those out and tell you that they figure very prominently in the story of gemini 9. in any event on display we have the uh, uh roast beef with gravy we have peaches which do not look appetizing at all we have small bite-sized beef sandwiches and the strawberry cereal cubes so it was uh the diet was rudimentary at best but it was going to be enough to get you through for four days up on orbit. And of course, the people in the food lab were working uh, daily to uh, uh, increase the uh, quality of this food, <clears throat> but you were on kind of a tight schedule and you weren't going to be able to get colmail fall or, you know, a space uh, ISS-like food for, for many, many years. You were just gonna have enough food to sustain you uh, and cold water to go with it. And in fact, on the first flights with that water gun, they saw that the water had some uh, contaminants that the guys called furries. And to describe them, they're probably about that big. And they, do you remember sea monkeys? Yes, they, right. Yeah, yeah. They, and a little they, sea monkey they, thing you made. They looked like sea monkeys. Uh -huh. And of course, the food labs were telling the guys, hey, they're harmless. They're not going to hurt you. Just go ahead and drink it. So a lot of the guys, in order to... Uh, uh, get past that they would infuse their water with tang or some sort of fruit drink so they wouldn't have to look at those things as they drank it well we're talking with mr nick thomas here as you see lead communicator k visitor center complex 35 years you put in out there and more and uh, we have a little hiccup going in our Streamlabs mm -hmm. program here that once it passes and we're, we're usually smooth sailing there, mm -hmm. you don't see it on your screen at home. But Nick, tell me, have you did you ever meet Ed White or, or Jim McDivitt? And we I just did. lost Jim McDivitt last last yeah. December, I think. Regretfully, uh, I did not meet Ed White. Uh, Ed, of course, passed in 67 in the Apollo 1 fire. But I did have the honor of meeting Jim McDivitt under very unique circumstances. Mm -hmm. I was leading a VIP tour that day of a father and son. And I've been told that the son was very, very interested in the lunar module. So we went out to the Apollo Saturn V Center. And at the time, the lunar module was suspended from the ceiling. So we went out there and he was just absolutely awestruck. And I was telling him about the vehicle and how it was manufactured and how it flew and as much as I could about it. So after we finished up, we went back to the main visitor's complex to a restaurant we had there at the time. We sat down for lunch, and I turned over and I looked at the next table, and who's sitting there but Jim McDivitt. Wow. So I went over, <clears throat> I excused myself, and I went over and I said, uh, General McDivitt, I said, it's, I said, I've got a young man here who's very intensely interested in the lunar module, and if you could speak to him, I'm sure you'd get a kick out of it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So when he finished his meal, he beckoned us over, and we walked over to the table, and I told the young boy, I said, you remember that lunar module that we were looking at at the Apollo Saturn V Center? He said, yeah. I said, well, meet its first test pilot. It and Jack. Jim just wow. lit up. And he was he would he spent a lot of time talking to that young man. Oh, and uh, that was one of two occasions, as I recall, that I met uh, General McDivitt. Uh, just a very soft-spoken, very gentle man, uh considered by many as being uh, probably 
next to Neil Armstrong, the best pilot of the uh, second group of astronauts. But uh, you could easily see how he would be chosen for that Apollo 9 mission to test the LEM. And in fact, when that time came to choose uh, C prime and make Apollo 8 a lunar orbiting mission, McDivitt was offered that mission first because that was going to be his spacecraft. He said, no, he said, we're going to stay with our mission. We're going to stay with the flight of, of the LEM and so forth. So he made <clears throat> that conscious decision to stay with that flight, which is really, as was called later on, it was a connoisseur's flight because it had everything he'd possibly want as a test pilot. And then after Apollo 9, Jim moved on to uh, serve as the Apollo program manager and did an excellent job. Um, I remember the, seeing the images of him <clears throat> in mission control with Chris Kraft and Bob Gilruth, and he's there in the coat without the tie, and it's during Apollo 13, and you could see the concern on their faces here trying to get these guys back. But General Jim McDivitt was a remarkable man, and the program is so much better for him having been a part of it. Yes, he definitely could have been a commander of a moon landing oh, mission. Oh, easily so. Easily and, so. But he became more valuable, I think, as manager of the Apollo program. He really, really did. He really came into his uh, stride as a, as a manager for the program and uh, was a great successor to uh, George Lowe, who'd been the, the previous program yeah, manager. Yeah, just... And he saw the need to continue to proceed with these Apollo missions, but also to always have in mind the safety of the crew because that was a world that he came from. Absolutely. So we miss Jim McDivitt. Uh, he died at uh, last uh, fall, age uh, 92 or 93. Yeah. He was one of the, the older ones there. And of course, we've got the two oldest human beings that have orbited the Earth. Those are living right now, Ella buddies. Foreman and Lovell. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I think they're 94. Bless their hearts. It's absolutely. And uh, going on there. Well, we seem to have gotten caught up with our Streamlabs here. Nick was talking about this There's kind of food, food that yeah. they took with them there. There's your water and gun. And sir, I'll let you take over now. <laughs> now, if you look below and to the left, you'll see those uh, surgical, the surgical scissors. Yeah. And using those to cut open a bag of food was somewhat overkill, I thought. <laughs> yeah. But as I say, those scissors are going to come into play when we get to the flight of Gemini 9 and Gene Cernan's EVA. All right. Well, this is quite a relic of space age, and you can see it on a Kennedy Space mm -hmm. Center yourself. That famous uh, handheld maneuvering unit, sometimes referred to as the zip gun. You see the two wands that extend from the center with the two uh, uh, nozzles, and they're uh, propelled by those two small uh, oxygen tanks on the bottom. There's also, if you look closely, just below the junction of the uh, thruster wand, there is another nozzle that would uh, 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 give uh, aft propulsion. Hmm. Uh, Ed White said it was very useful on uh, pitch and yaw. Uh, the big problem was he simply didn't have enough fuel in those in those two uh, in those two tanks. And after he exhausted that fuel, he just went on to using the tether to pull himself from place to place. But again. <clears throat> That zip gun uh, was the very first step in uh, propulsion for a, a, an astronaut in uh, in EVA. Nikon the... camera attached. Now, and that's an interesting thing because you and I were talking about that before the show. And I will ask anyone out there in the audience who's listening now to to point me in the right direction. But I have not seen in my lifetime any pictures identified as being pictures taken by Ed White with that camera during Gemini 4. I just haven't. Now, they're they're probably out there, and if somebody out there knows where they are or can send them to us, I'd be very, very grateful because those, oh, those would have to be some Boy, if you haven't pictures. found them, Nick, I don't know where they are because that's why I said we've got behind us here uh, Gene Cernan's photograph that yeah. I thought, that this is what mm -hmm. Ed White should have took a few pictures yeah, like sure. that. It would have been unnatural. Uh, and uh, we posted over the weekend a 4K resolution from a German group. I didn't like the music behind it, but boy, mm -hmm. is it sharp of what Ed was doing there. Mm -hmm. And he he really had very little control of where he could go no, once that gun started. You know, you, uh, you uh, quit using you it. You really you were really faced with immutable laws of physics in zero gravity. Uh, here on Earth, an action, every action uh, results in an opposite and equal reaction. 
will take that formula and take it to the 10th power when you're up in microgravity because there's yeah. nothing stopping you. Absolutely. And astronauts have said time and time again, it takes time to get your space legs to find your center of gravity. I had the privilege of flying on the Zero-G aircraft several years ago, and I can tell you that it's not as easy as it looks. But Rick Searfoss had given me some advice before I flew, and he said, take one parabola to do the Zen thing. I said, what's the Zen thing? He said, just float there, arms outstretched, close your eyes, and don't do anything. I said, okay. So for the first two or three parabolas, I was pretty much bouncing off the bulkheads. <laughs> but then I remember what, what Rick had told me, so I did the Zen thing for one parabola. And after that, I found it much easier to, ter to determine my center of mass. I had a better understanding about how much or how little power I needed to push off to go from one direction to the other. I wasn't Gene Kelly, but I was doing a <laughs> lot better than I was before I did the Zen thing. Interesting. Yeah. That's well. There's some experience that Nick's got at at the training for a space. My right there. wife, my wife got me that flight as a present on my birthday. No, not on my birthday. I went on July 21st, uh, the anniversary of Liberty Bell Seven. Oh, okay. And um, Charlie Walker was at the space center at the time. And yeah. As soon as I got back, I went to Charlie and totally debriefed everything. Oh, done. cool. Yeah. Yeah, well, so Charlie appreciated that. We've we've spent some time with him. Yeah. He's he's an awesome. Charlie yeah, Walker. Charlie Walker was the first shuttle astronaut I ever met. Oh, is that right? He was, yeah. Wow. And you know what? He sat right there, mm -hmm. and I asked him, "Where'd you keep? Where do you keep your astronaut wings, Charlie? In your in your wife's jewelry box or in your sock drawer?" And Nick, you mm -hmm. thought I'd. I killed his dog or something, the mm -hmm. look on his face. He does not have no. astronaut wings because they're not given the mission specialists. No, they're not, not given the payload specialists. Payload specialists. Not uh, Charlie specialists. and the other payload, payload specialists are not NASA employees. Yeah. And so they're, yeah. That includes J.D. Bartow and a couple uh, others. People who've done some remarkable work up on orbit. But now they can receive their astronaut rings uh, after the fact from the uh, ASC, from the uh, Association of Space Explorers. Yep. They have those yeah. wings now for uh, all space uh, flyers. And Charlie told us about that, too. We, we, we digress on a lot of things. Just go get you a snack if you need one, because <laughs> Nick Thomas has got a lot more to share. We're just kicking off here, our show barely, with the guys having breakfast. There. Yeah. This, now this and, was and you a, got a personal story about this, I yeah, know. Yeah, I have a wonderful personal stake in this picture. Uh, here on the right facing us, you see Ed White. And the other, uh, on the other side in the middle is Jim McDivitt with his uh, back to us. Now, the two priests there, the priest uh, raising his glass, I believe he was Jim McDivitt's priest from uh, uh, Houston. And the priest on the far end there is Father Irvine Nugent. Now, Father Nugent was the priest at my school, Our Lady of Lords. So for three or four weeks after this, we walked around with our chests out in the sky <laughs> because our priest had breakfast with the astronauts. And St. Paul's and St. Brendan's couldn't touch that. <laughs> this but, up in Daytona Beach. Right. And uh, uh, Father Nugent later, uh, Monsignor Nugent in Daytona Beach, wonderful, wonderful man in the, the classic parish priest in the best sense of the word. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Well, then uh, the traditional breakfast goes right way, Mark, there. Get checked out there. Yeah, we are in the suit-up trailer over at Pad 16. And, of course, I'll see the astronaut office, Alan Shepard there overseeing everything, and along with Joe Schmidt and Ed White there. Uh, Shepard, of course, the chief of the astronaut office, was uh, closely involved in all aspects of crew operations. That was his responsibility. And I sometimes think that a Shepard's main focus was, was not so much what was going on with the flight as much as it was keeping an eye on the astronauts. Uh, he was always there, and uh, he always ran a very tight ship. And uh, here you see him in the uh, Bad 16 trailer with uh, Ed White and Joe Schmidt. Yeah, there's a lot of pictures of him, meetings and stuff like that. He's all in the, the way, background. All the way through Apollo, up through Apollo 9. And after Apollo 9, he had been cleared to return to flight status after he had that operation in Los Angeles. And after that, he was in the classrooms, he was in the training sessions, he was in the sim, and everybody realized that Big Al was back on the yeah. road and he was going yeah. to he was going to make a, a flight. And by no means uh, was he 
was he going to be unprepared for that eventuality? He, he bore down, and at the event that I did with Marty a few, uh, a couple of months ago, mm -hmm. uh, with the Grumman uh, reunion, the Grumman guys all talked about how great it was working with Al Shepard, because they had experienced, they had, had the, the experience with Shepard as a chief astronaut, mission manager, things of that nature. And he could be very hard, very unyielding, and, and he could really put his shoulder into his arguments. But they said once he became a crew member of Apollo 14, he was just as genial, and he was just as dedicated to the mission, and just as friendly to all the uh, uh, flight controllers, trainers, the Grumman guys. Uh, they were all very, very impressed with him. So. Uh, Admiral Shepard had the chance, I think, in that mm -hmm. mission to take off the mask of its icy commander and uh, really become part of a crew again. And it was just a great highlight for him. And I think he would never have done anything to uh, to jeopardize that. Our Mercury astronaut hero, the only mm -hmm. Mercury astronaut to walk on the moon. Yeah. Sure wish, uh, uh, I wish Wally would have been able to walk on the moon of uh, too. But I know you do too. Yeah. But Wally, uh, and, and Wally, Gus. Wally, by that time had he he said the business just consumed yeah. you, which it did, yeah. and he was ready to step away. And everybody, not just astronauts, pilots make that decision in their own time. That's and, right. Uh, well, here's a, a photograph that uh, I told Nick I'd never seen before. He's yeah. always great at bringing in pictures that are from the NASA archives. This is a photographer's artistic mm. moment there. Yeah. Who are the, the two gentlemen behind In there? the background, you can see Joe Schmidt, the okay. uh, prime suit tech. His assistant, whose name I can't recall right now, you might remember it. But in the foreground, of course, Ed White and Jim McDivitt in a very contemplative mood. And I think the reason for that is that on launch day, the only time that you didn't have to be doing something was in the elevator. And that was probably the only time you had a chance to kind of gather your thoughts, think about what you're about to do. And then when those elevator doors opened up on the uh, spacecraft level, it was back to work. So I always enjoyed this picture. And I think it's highly reflective of the nature of, I can certainly speak for, for Jim McDivitt, <clears throat> Pardon me, Ed White, as I say, I had not met, but by all I'm able to gather from his history, uh, yeah, this is definitely a, 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 a moment where you can mm -hmm. really see uh, 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 what's inside of them, what they're thinking about, and how they're approaching this thing. Just love that picture. And, and both being Catholics, I imagine that there was perhaps a private prayer said during yeah. that right up the elevator. There might be in yeah. there, and they uh, notice the helmet, folks, and and the neck down yeah. there. When they sit down, all that comes up, and and the helmet is actually above their nose. Now, if, when if you look at Jim, uh, just uh, at the apex on his uh, neck ring, uh -huh. you can see a wire leading up there, uh -huh. and that leads to a pull strap that's right here on your chest. And once you get inside the spacecraft and you're on your back, to set that settle that helmet back, you pull that lanyard. And that pulls the cables, which pulls your neck ring down and keeps your helmet from floating up and blocking your eyesight. What a great, there! that's that's awesome. You see it on the left side on Ed White there, mm -hmm. the, those wires there. I thought that was an escape system thing. No, so. no, that was simply, that's a right. neck ring to keep your uh, helmet from floating up too high yeah. when you're laying down. Now on Ed's helmet, of course, you can see that golden visor. And after Gemini 4, uh, the astronauts who were going to be doing spacewalks would on launch day, they would have a cloth cover over that visor to keep it from being scratched. Gotcha, yeah. yeah. Here we are in the white room up at uh, spacecraft level. You've got uh, Jim Lovell, uh, the backup pilot there in the center, and uh, Ed and uh, Jim McDivitt about to uh, board the spacecraft. Look at the gold visor, folks. Yeah. As Nick pointed that out, you go right to it on Ed there in the foreground. Now, Ed has something in his hand, which I can't tell what it Smart is. Smart tablet, of course. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, it's probably one of a number of gag gifts that were exchanged between the uh, I guess, uh, yeah. Gunther Wentz crew and the astronauts. So and we'll see an example yep, of that on yep. Gemini 9. That's right. We'll see yeah. the mayor of Pad 14. Uh, pad 19. Or 19, I'm uh, sorry. Yeah, 19. There you go. There's liftoff. Again, another beautiful liftoff from Launch Pad 19. Uh, just an iconic view here of this vehicle clearing the top of the tower. The famous uh, uh, BRFC 
the big red something yeah. cloud, as, as the Air Force guys called it. <laughs> but that was a hypergolic vehicle burning uh, nitrogen tetroxide and uh, uh, monomethyl hydrazine. Uh, very, very dangerous stuff. If it gets loose, it will dry clean your lungs. If it gets on your skin, it can kill you. Um, they were opening a manifold on an RCS thruster on the shuttle in the OPF years ago, and they opened it up, and a drop of this stuff hit the floor, and right away, three guys right to the hospital. Very dangerous. Stuff. Go through wood, metal, or your, your arm, whatever. Hypergolic fuels fuel in this Titan II rocket that was going to have nuclear warheads on it. Nick, mm -hmm. did you and your family ever come down and see a Titan launch? No, we did not see a Titan launch here. Of course, I would watch them on television and then run out in the backyard. And, of course, the Titan burned so clean that we couldn't really see the rocket from that distance until it hit the condensation layer, uh -huh. and you got that big white trail, trail behind the rocket, and that's when we could see it. And still, it was exciting to realize that there were two men on the top of that uh contrail traveling faster and faster and faster all the time well june 3rd 1965 mm -hmm. is a moment iconic moment in nasa because of this image absolutely and we've talked about this several times and we both talked about how these images affected us as we were growing up but this was the time as a young boy in elementary school that i saw that this was just leading into areas that i could not have imagined only two or three years before that during Project Mercury. It was going up in a capsule and coming back down. But now we're stepping outside of the spacecraft and we're truly getting ready to work in the microgravity environment as we'll have to when we get to the to this surface of the moon. Uh, just the poetic beauty of those images were just enough to stop your heart. I mean, you can look at something like that and you can see the science and the engineering, and it's all there. But when you see the absolute stark beauty of that human being out in the void, in the middle, and set against God's creation right there with the beautiful uh, clouds on the ground, you can't help but realize that this is something bigger than men flying in space. This is something that speaks deeply to the human spirit. This is our heritage as explorers, uh, rightfully going back to uh, Daniel Boone and to the other great explorers of our time and the men who are willing to reach out into that dangerous area to take those chances to learn things that had not been known before and yeah to also uh, engage in an experience that was going to be different than anything you'd ever known in your life so yeah it was all there and it was just an absolute um, inspiration for kids in uh, grade school at that time. This was the future, and we were watching it happen right before our eyes. Of course, we didn't get these images until about two weeks after the flight when they were published in Life magazine and National Geographic. But I still can't look at those images without it going straight to my heart and to the emotional impact that those images carried for me when I was a young boy. Well said, Nick, and, and of all the spacewalks afterwards and so forth, these are, this, this one will always be these are the, the iconic, history books. They, these are like and, the pictures of Buzz on the Moon. Yeah. And, uh, there are several lunar missions after that, but yeah. that one image is the one that people think of when you say man on the moon, and when you say walking in space, this is what they think of. And that, like Nick said, uh, all we heard was the radio transmissions yeah. Yeah. of this, and then the newspaper had the headlines, but there was no photographs, yeah. though uh, Jim McDivitt nothing. took these outstanding photographs. Nothing there was nothing times. until uh, the, 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 the weekly magazines come out. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've always thought about the guy in the Johnson Space Center lab that had to develop the film, having developed yeah. thousands of rolls of film yeah. myself. Yeah. Uh, I'd be a little nervous. Okay? Oh, I would too. Absolutely. Like it was with the moon. Sure. Though, but sure. but uh, well said, Nick. Th these images will last this test of time, mm -hmm. 100 and, years from now. And they continue to inspire young people. That's what absolutely. I love about Yeah, absolutely. But the, the family is, of course, a huge part of every spacecraft yeah. mission. Now, this was a first. This was the first time we had brought a family into mission control to talk to the crew. And as you look at this picture to the right, the young boy standing there is young Ed White III. Uh, sitting in the foreground, of course, is Flight Director Chris Kraft. 
After him, you see uh, uh, Pat White, uh, Ed's wife. Uh -huh. uh, after that, uh, Jim McDivitt's daughter. And then after that, uh, Pat McDivitt, uh, Jim's wife. So this was the first time that a family was brought in to talk to their uh, loved ones uh, when they were up in orbit. Um, the Russians had never done this before. And I think this added a very important human element to what was going on at the time because it would have been so easy to put the families in the background to forget the families. But I think NASA realized even beyond uh, public relations, NASA realized that it was important to um, not only maintain the, the, the links between the family members, some in orbit, some on the ground, but also as a way of recognizing the families for what they do. And I will tell you, there's not an astronaut out there who won't tell you that it's the family who got them there. Uh, uh, Sammy Gamar talks about his family. He says, flying in space was my dream. It wasn't theirs. So I just brought them along in all of this. And the, all the astronauts, to man, to a man and woman, will tell you the importance of the support of your family and your loved ones when you're doing something like this. Now, Nick, you said earlier this is the first uh, that the uh, flight control mission headquarters had been moved from Kennedy Space Center yeah. for the first mission here. So mm -hmm. that's a brand new, fresh. Here we are in the mission yeah. operations control room, the MOKER, as it came to be known. MOKER, okay. And, and uh, utilizing, still utilizing the tracking stations around the world and we did not have certainly did not have teachers at the time so there were points in time during the mission where the spacecraft could not communicate with the ground um but of course they can constantly now with teachers but this was the um, this was the culmination in the design uh and the and the um, theories that Chris Kraft had about what mission control should be. He put all the mission rules together during Mercury, and that uh, MOKER at Johnson Space Center was designed along his lines and his philosophy of the uh, flight control team. So it's a very, very iconic room. That room is still uh, preserved to this day in its original configuration as it was during Apollo. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are other active uh, flight control rooms now, but <clears throat> that control room is uh, is held as it is, and mm -hmm. people who tour Johnson Space Center can see that uh, uh, MOKER. I had the privilege during uh, STS-102 to go to Houston, and we toured that, my group toured that room, and I got to sit in the flight director's chair. Yeah. So that was, that was awfully nice. Did you ever meet Chris Kraft? I did not meet Chris. The only flight, dirt, let's see, I met uh, Gene Krantz, and um, uh, one of the flight directors, um, uh, Glenn Griffin. Uh, right. Griffin. Uh, Griffin. Uh, he got me the autographs of uh, Chris and Milt Windler and uh, several of the other classic flight directors on a piece of paper that had the symbol for mission control on it. So oh, that's wow. something that I... Chris Kraft, very interesting man. Mm -hmm. um, he did not like being in, in uh, 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 Florida at Cape Kennedy. We have a 15-minute video on YouTube that's worth <laughs> watching. Uh, he didn't like restaurants. He didn't like hotels he wasn't familiar with and restaurants he wasn't familiar with. Well, Chris, he liked to be at home. Chris was he, a, he said that. Chris was interview. a Virginia boy. Yeah, that's right. He, yeah. Would have, he, would have, he wouldn't have minded uh, keeping the control center, or not the control center, excuse me, but uh, he loved Langley, Virginia, and that was that was really his home. But when it came time to move the Mission Control Center to Johnson Space Center, he, of course, went with it. And a lot of people say it was only because of Lyndon Johnson that that uh, Moker landed in Houston. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, there were politicians in Texas, such as Olin Teague and Jim Wright and um, several others, congressmen and senators, who strongly backed the space program. And it was as much as a nod to their support and their help that uh, uh, Houston was the right choice to uh, put the Mission Control Center. Now, originally they were talking about moving it, they are talking about moving it up to the Florida Panhandle, but then the people making the decision said, no, Florida's got enough right now, let's, let's look at other places. And Houston was the, was the place. 
Well, we're getting a real history net lesson today with Mr. Nick Thomas. So grateful he spends his time once a month to come and be, appear on Stay Curious and tell you these fabulous stories and in-depth uh, behind the scenes. And as well as, you know, you're just a great space historian. You can't help me when you're when you're living it for your job. Yeah. Uh, you threw this beautiful picture in there. I'd oh, like yeah. to see this picture 50 years later and see what the uh the smog or whatever's done what now the great I, thing, I couldn't figure this out I'll tell you where it is uh the great thing about gemini 4 was the fact that we're going to be up on orbit for four days now we really had an opportunity to hone our skills on earth observations and earth photography now what you're looking at here is the uh, nile river delta and if you look up to oh, the, the delta of it the green area yeah. wow now if you look up to the left where it comes to a point that's where Cairo is. And if you look to the right of that, you'll see a patch of sand that's wider than the surrounding sand. Yeah. Yeah. And what you're looking at there are the pyramids of Giza. Oh. Now, the reason that that land is different colored is because those are the footprints of thousands and thousands of tourists and uh, coming there over the years, or hundreds of years to visit the pyramids. And their constant presence is tamp down that sand to a lower level where it's a little wider and it's a little firmer. So what you're seeing there is... Yeah, that's right, this area right here. You're uh, saying, no, right? look, go to your right, go to the point to your right. Yeah, come on up. Oh, come there. Come on up, up, up further to the right. Can to the you right. do it? Can you see if you yeah, can let me up. see if I can do it. Uh, yeah, see, you're kind of counterintuitive here. And you're doing? going over to the area right up there. Okay, right up here. Yeah. Okay, got gotcha. you, yeah. right up here. And Roger Crouch told me taught me how to find the pyramids at the uh, Nile River Delta. Oh, so right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Wow, what a delta there! Oh, isn't really it beautiful? Cool. Yeah, it's it gorgeous. Is beautiful. And look at the clarity of that picture. I know. It's yeah, that's why I said I'd love to see it 50 yes, years later. Where, and I'm sure someone's got it there. Well, all good things come to an end, and here's Jim McDivitt in the raft during the uh, recovery. <clears throat> we recovered on board the USS Wasp, uh, which recovered more. Gemini crews and any other carrier mm -hmm. and by this time Ed is probably in the winch and headed up to the helicopter and uh, Jim McDivitt is there in the uh, in the life raft of course you can see the stabilization collar on the spacecraft the uh, um, uh, skin divers the frogmen have that well secured and it will later be hoisted on board the aircraft carrier mm -hmm. I always it's always amazing. Go out and do a spacewalk and then land in the ocean and, oh, yeah. and probably throw up because of hell <laughs> but from, from the, the ocean thing in there. But they will all tell you that opening those hatches and smelling that fresh yeah. sea air was just uh, incredible. And uh, I guess kind of, that was a scene that we had just a couple of days ago when the crew uh, Dragon came back, mm -hmm. Freedom, with uh, Peggy Whitson. And I heard Peggy make the comment that that she was grateful that the the, the seas were pretty calm for her oh, yeah, tummy. She said, "You there. bet. That's that's yeah. not an easy thing to be doing." Yeah. All and right. then on the uh, if we go the other direction, here we are on the wasp. The crew on board the wasp, they're walking upright. They're feeling good. And at this point, in fact, Ed White said he was very tempted to do a backflip. Really, he was walking down the the red carpet on the carrier. But he realized what the implications would be if he slipped or came down wrong. So he, he didn't do that. But he's fully equipped to do that because he was one of the most athletic astronauts uh, in the office at the time. In fact, a competitor for the uh, Olympics back in the 1950s and only missed being a participant in the Olympics five That's times. right. That's yeah. right. And one other amazing fact you might not know about Ed White is he has an identical twin brother. I will tell you, I've met his son, and his son is a splitting image of, of Ed White. Well, I heard a story about at his funeral, the Apollo <laughs> One Way, that, that an astronaut saw Ed White's twin walk down the aisle, and he about oh. passed out. Wow. Because he didn't know he had an identical twin. Didn't know that. Didn't know yeah. that. The only identical twin I was ever aware of was Charlie Duke. Okay. Charlie, Charlie has an identical Charlie twin. Duke's That's a identical. Story. Okay. Well, we had to throw in there. Thank Chris you, Callie. Mr. Chris Kelly, your yeah. beautiful, iconic uh, painting mm -hmm. of Ed White's spacewalk in there. Just simply beautiful. I've got a T-shirt of that. And we're going to tell you in the next day or two how you can own a, this image on a T-shirt mm -hmm. that uh, Chris Kelly, the son of the great Paul Kelly, both fabulous artists in there. Well, we've got another... Uh -huh. 
launch to talk about there. So if you got to carry the your, your laptop with you, the refrigerator there to the, here, we're going to hear some more great stories from Nick about Gemini 9. And let's just let people know Roman numerals is the correct way to label these missions. Right oh, there. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, the Roman numeral was, I think, discontinued during Apollo. And uh, Al Warden told me this story that they said, okay, from now on, Arabic numbers only. So, of course, Al was a proponent of the Roman numerals. And if you look closely on the Apollo 15 patch, look at the, the shadows in the craters, and you'll see that, first of all, they go in opposite directions, which is not physically possible. But the reason they do is because there are the letters X and V blended into those craters. And so that's how Al Warden, he said, nobody in Washington never caught it. Is that right? That's yeah. the way the, the patch flew. Yes. But this picture, of course, the patch for Gemini 9, of course, showing the two major mission objectives, which was rendezvous and docking and then uh, EVA. And, of course, the tether uh, line very cleverly uh, manipulated into the shape of a Arabic 9. There you go. Yeah. All right. I didn't know the, the, the tether. That's mm -hmm. a, I love learning something every day, Nick. I never there, looked at that. Nine there, are the Easter eggs, there are Easter eggs in all these mission oh, patches. There certainly are. To, to there certainly relate. are. And we know our artist friend, uh, Chris Cowley, appreciates those mm -hmm. Easter eggs. Yeah. Uh, well, here's a, there's a big story behind this, folks. And yeah. We know many of you know, but here are two outstanding astronauts that we lost even in 1965 or 66 after the gemini 9 mission it 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 acquired a reputation in the press as being a snake bit mission and that all started with the unfortunate death of our prime crew elliot c on the left and charlie bassett on the right about three weeks before the uh, flight let me check my date on that oh i'm sorry excuse me four months before the launch. Uh, both Prime and backup crews were flying into St. Louis to the McDonald plant where the spacecraft was being constructed and tested. And the two sets of airplanes uh, made different decisions. Uh, the two airplanes made different decisions. Tom Stafford called for a breakout to the west because all this fog was so thick and he wanted to try again from a long distance to set up for an approach. Charlie on the uh, 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 Elliot on the other hand elected to remain in the pattern and take a veer off to the left and reinsert himself into the downwind leg to come around to base to final and touchdown. Unfortunately, in the downwind leg, the, as I say, the fog was very thick, and their jet collided with the building in which their spacecraft was being worked on. And in fact, Tom and Gene did not know about this until they got on the ground. Uh, a terrible, terrible loss. But uh, this was one of the first instances where we saw the change of a crew. And this, along with the change of Apollo 8 to C prime, these scrambled flight crew assignments in such a way that, long story short, Neil Armstrong became the first man on the moon instead of P. Conrad. And we'll do a show on that sometime. Good, good. But there you have uh, our original prime crew, uh, uh, fine men. And uh, it was a terrible loss. So we moved at that time to the, the yeah. backup crew. Uh, and just uh, Elliot C. would have been a rookie commander, mm. of course, on there. And uh, both, uh, yeah. I, I've researched these gentlemen and just tremendous loss. Both just great aviators and, and would have played major role in the Apollo moon landings. Yeah, now Elliot was a civilian test pilot for General Electric. Okay. And uh, Charlie, was, uh, uh, Charlie was Air Force. All right. Well, they they got replaced by these guys. Yes, our prime crew, uh, Tom Stafford on the left and Gene Cernan on the right. Tom Stafford, an incredible, incredible man, uh, who who has forgotten more about rendezvous and uh, <laughs> uh, orbit operations than anyone will could possibly remember. But uh, he was an he was a test pilot at Edwards Air Force Base. He went on to be an instructor at Edwards Air Force Base. He wrote a number of the textbooks that the pilots studied at Edwards Air Force Base. Gene Cernan on the right there. Now, Gene was part of the third group of astronauts, and Gene was not a test pilot. Gene was a Navy carrier pilot. And this was by the time, by the time we come to the second group, 
we had pretty much tossed off the requirement of being a test pilot, although we were still selecting them. Now, Gene, as I say, was a Navy carrier pilot, which is no small feat in itself. But, you know, every, um, every organization has its hierarchy. And let's say the fighter pilots and the test pilots are at the top of the pyramid in this particular organization. So there are some people who are thinking of serving as being, oh, the carrier pilot. It happens in every, every, <laughs> every organization. But nevertheless, Gino was going to, uh, he was tasked with performing what was going to be one of the most complex spacewalks that we had ever uh, done. Now, Dave Scott was originally supposed to perform a spacewalk on Gemini 8, but of course that mission was aborted early. But Gino had the task of flying this Air Force experiment known as the AMU, the Astronaut Maneuvering Unit. Now, if you look in his hands, he's holding the hand controllers for translational and attitude control. Uh, you'll also notice the, the color of, his, uh, of the pants. Now, those pants were made of woven nickel alloy called hmm. chromal, chromal R. And the reason for that was that that backpack put out jet gas in the form of, um, oh, what did we use on Mercury? Um, not hydrocols. Hydrazine? Uh, no, not hydrazine. Uh, nitrogen per, uh, uh, peroxide. It was pro Nitrogen. Oh, gosh. I'm thinking nitrogen peroxide. In any event... That gas blew out of that hat, hot, that backpack very, very hot. And so that's why if you're able to look closely toward uh, Gino's side on the bottom of the backpack, you'll see one of the thrusters. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's aimed pretty much at its leg. Wow, yeah. So they came up with those specially designed... Dark little mark there. The specially designed uh, uh, pants. This is a mission, as I say, it was being described as a snake bit. But I think really it's a mission where we went in several areas, we went a bridge too far. <clears throat> now this rig in the back of the adapter section was where Gino had to make his way back to to get into that backpack. And you can see it has very rudimentary uh, hand holds and foot holds, but no tethers. And unfortunately, <clears throat> you got into that thing. And if you had to connect or disconnect hoses, you were going to start waggling around because of the of the physical inputs you were making so there was no way to really steady yourself and as a as a result of this trying to get worked into that backpack gino worked up about a hundred percent humidity in that suit his visor fogged over uh he couldn't see out the visor and what he did in fact was he leaned forward and he used his nose to wipe a little porthole in that fog on the helmet so he could he could see but uh <clears throat> He was working himself up into such a lather uh, that uh, Tom Stafford <coughs> eventually called a halt to the EVA and, and brought him back in. And over the next several pictures, we'll tell you a little bit about the other uh, problems that Gino faced on that EVA. Wanted to point out that uh, Gene Cernan and Tom Stafford, unbelievably f close friends for life. Uh, mm -hmm. They really bonded. Uh, I was at I've been to the Cosmosphere several mm -hmm. times in Kansas, yeah. and uh, Max Airy, the director there, was on the phone. He was giving me some time, but he says, I just got off the phone with, with Tom, and of course, Gene's going to call me right back so I can tell him what I told Tom. Yeah. Uh, very active, both of them, in mm -hmm. the uh, Tom Stafford Air and Space Museum in Weatherford, mm -hmm. Oklahoma. It, that has to be on your bucket list for sure. Yeah, and of course, Tom and Gene went on to fly together again on... Apollo 10. Exactly. Yes. Now here we see, and and they uh, they, uh, they they had a good time there. I was gonna think. Here we see another uh, point of uh, crisis during <coughs> the uh, run up to Gemini 9. This is in the white room, and the guys have just gotten out of the spacecraft. Their launch has been scrubbed because their Agena target has fallen off the radar screen. It's separated from the Atlas booster but did not fire its engine for this uh, orbital burn and eventually just fell into the ocean. So here are the guys and just basically Tom's consoling Gene. And of course, it's about the time that Tom Stafford becomes the mayor of Pad 19 
because of his additional scrubs on on Gemini yep. uh, six. So he was on Gemini six, right. uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. famously with Wally right. Shaw when the engine started and mm -hmm. it stopped. And, and before that, they lost an Agena that blew up uh, before it got into orbit, and they scrubbed several times on that. But finally, here we are on launch day. The guy's coming out of the uh, suiting trailer over at Pad 16. And you know this is Florida. When you look down at the ground, you see all <laughs> the grass and the pebbles and so forth. You definitely know that you're on the Florida coast in this picture. Well, I'm going to be looking at all these Gemini 9 pictures at Gino's different pants that he yeah. has there. Yeah, in the you back can see him. Yeah, you see the, the dark pictures. pants there. Yeah. That was something I his, What do you call them? His cast, his cast iron trousers, I think he called them. And he said they were about as comfortable as a rusty suit of armor. Oh, that had to be horrible to fit in yeah. afterwards. Well, there's a the mayor. There's a well, yeah. uh, Stafford. He's got a scepter in his hand. Uh, he hasn't got a scepter. He has got a simulated match, and this was given to him by Gunther oh, West. That's a big and match. this is basically, hey man, if you gotta light the rocket engine, get it done. I don't care how you get it done. <laughs> but you can also see in this picture um, the backup crew. Uh, Buzz Aldrin, and uh, in the distance, I think, is Jim Lovell. Now, this is also a very important picture, and Gene talks about this in his book, The Last Man on the Moon. During this preparation, before they got in the spacecraft, oh, I'm sorry, in the very deep background, that's Deke Slayton. Okay. And what happened was Deke called Tom over to the side in the white room and had a private conversation with him. It lasted for about 30 seconds. And... Gino was thinking, you know, are I a member of the crew too? What's this all about? You know, nobody likes to have a yeah be kept out of a conversation. Well, it turns out that Deke was reminding Tom that if something happened in during the EVA and they couldn't get Gino back into the spacecraft, he was going to have to unplug him and come home alone. And he was just reminding Tom about that. Is that Tom, right? And Tom understood that, but Gino didn't really realize that until after the flight, sometime after the flight. Mm -hmm. Oh, here, nitrogen tetroxide. Thank you very much. Carlton. Okay, Carl, thank you, CB. I appreciate it. Nitrogen that. tetroxide. 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 Yeah, that's, the... that's hot stuff. And you don't really want to screw with that unprotected. That's what they use to maneuver on, on the this AMU. backpack, yeah, supposedly. Right. Uh, so <laughs> Stafford had four, uh, uh, Two failed launch attempts and two successful launch mm -hmm. attempts. So he got the nickname the mayor of Pad 19. 19 up yeah. there. So, and I know he embraces that. By the way, he's 94 years old, and he was at the Astronaut Hall of Fame back in April. One of my friends, a tour escort, uh, many years ago, took Tom back out to Pad 19. And, of course, by this time, it was overgrown with weeds, and the erector tower was laying there, rusting up and so forth. And the driver told me that tears came to Tom's eyes. Oh. He said, the last time I was here, this place was like an effing golf course. Oh. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah it's, it's amazing that we haven't preserved some of these national historic places. A real shame. That's for another commentary for yep. my wonderful Nick Thomas here. Nick, now, there's the gold wings open. A photographer's looking right. Looking down into uh, Gino's side on the right side. And again, you can see the... Uh, Cast iron pants, yeah, wearing. and uh, you know the typical uh, getting strapped in, setting the systems, and then closing the hatches and uh, launching. And there again, another beautiful launch from Pad 19. And as Tom said, there it is. It looks like a golf course. Mm -hmm. It's just so, so beautiful and uh, just, just so elegant. I mean, any artist would give his life to be able to render a painting as beautiful as that. Absolutely. Yeah. And here we are with the next snake bite of Gemini 9. We're scheduled, as I say, to dock with an Agena vehicle and, of course, fire that Agena rocket, boost the, uh, the altitude of the Gemini spacecraft. But that vehicle was lost on the radar, having fallen into the ocean. So the NASA guys came up with a quick idea of this vehicle called the ATDA, which was the Augmented Target Docking Adapter. And basically what it is, it's an Agena without the Agena rocket. It's just the docking collar. And it was stabilized. It was gyro-stabilized, so you could dock with it. But the idea was to dock with it. You had to get rid of that fairing up around the, uh, uh, the docking port. And as you can see here, that fairing is stuck in place by that silver retaining band. Now, the band was supposed to separate at two points. It was supposed to separate from the spacecraft 
and then separate the two halves from each other. Well, those charges apparently didn't work or the signal didn't reach them. And all that band did was slip up the nose and just hold the, that fairing into place. And of course, Tom Stafford uh, famously compared it to an angry alligator. Now, this is where those surgical scissors come in. Uh -huh. Now, while they're backed off and station keeping and trying to figure out a way to make this uh, docking happen, they're talking about possible ways of, of freeing those, those jaws. And Buzz Aldrin came up with the idea that Gino should go out, EVA, and take those same surgical scissors and cut that band, that stainless steel band. Well, my God, everybody looked at him like, what are you saying? Do you realize the possible implications of doing that in microgravity? That thing could break open, snap back, and cut Gino's suit open. It could also possibly behave the way high-pressure hoses have behaved on aircraft carriers when they were separated. Now, those co hoses carry several thousand pounds of pressure in them, and they're braided. They're covered by braided uh, uh, steel. And when one of those things cut loose, it can snap back and has, in several instances, cut a man in half. So the idea of doing anything off the cuff with this retaining band was just absolutely unthinkable. And management said, uh, no, we're not going to go there. We're just going to go ahead and do one more rendezvous exercise and just leave it as it is. And so they wisely did that. But that story comes from Deke Slayton's book. And Deke Slayton said after that, he always kind of had a jaundiced, eyes, uh, jaundiced eye when it came to uh, um, Buzz Aldrin's uh, um, thought process. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was too, way too dangerous for sure. Yeah. And then, you know, way too early in the program uh, for anything like yeah, that. Yeah, and you see later on even the Skylab situation oh, yeah. where, you bet. where, where uh, they cut Pete. something and Pete Conrad was lucky something didn't happen to him as he got flung across. As, as Pete put it in his inimitable way, he was thrown ass over tea kettles. <laughs> yes, he was. At, yeah. to uh, uh, When they cut the solar panel the, and released right. it on the Skylab, 50 years ago, yeah. coming up in November, we'll yeah. be celebrating that. As we are experiencing 50 years ago, the first crew of Skylab were in occupancy up yep. there right now at this moment. Conrad and his team. Yep. There's, there's a beautiful <laughs> shot taken by Gene at the beginning of his EVA. You can just see his hatch to the right of the image. And here we have a gorgeous image of the Baja Peninsula. Uh, and, you know... As you're going along like this, you you got to figure, oh, this is great. Nothing can go wrong on this EVA. But it was off to a, a, a good start. Here's a picture taken by Tom Stafford of Gene Cernan. And some people will quibble about the composition. Of course, Tom had a lot on his mind at this time and wasn't really you know, that much uh, uh, into the photography. But it's really a very beautiful image as you look at Gino's helmet as it's bisected by the tether. You look to the left and you see the image of the sun there. Mm -hmm. And that, again, that just really stirs uh, a, a deeper emotion that goes beyond engineering and, and flight. It really is a gorgeous, uh, gorgeous image. But having said that, here's Gino getting ready to go back to the adapter section. And he's already fighting with that tether, which is a very, very long and very complex piece of equipment and he's got to make his way back to the adapter to get himself into that AMU. Now the problem is you weren't given proper handholds for this job so you basically kind of had to find your handholds, ridges that you'll see there on the adapter section of the spacecraft. The problem is when you pull on an improvised handhold like that you may not pull through your center of mass or your hand may slip and in either of those events, you just end up in a flat spin. So now you've got to recover from that. You've got to stabilize yourself, and you've got to move forward, possibly getting into the same condition several more times. So Gino's getting his way back there, and he's working up a sweat. He starts breathing heavy. And um, um, who's our uh, flight doc? Um, Charles Berry. Chuck Berry. Yeah. Chuck Berry was watching his heart rate, and it was elevating to the point that Chuck was honestly worried that he that Gino was going to go into tachycardia. 
170 beats yeah, at yeah, sometimes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So here we are going through the spacewalk from hell. And uh, in in this know, is well displayed out there to Kennedy Visitors Complex at oh, yeah. the Astronaut uh, Hall of Fame. They have a video actually going on over yeah, the GT nine spacecraft there. Yeah, and you, you hear really the, a, you hear the air to ground. Yeah, and uh, as I say, Stern gets back there and trying to work himself into that uh, AMU, and Tom hears all this going on and he just calls the ball. He says, you know, we're um, we're going to terminate the EVA at this time. So now they've got to get Tino back into the spacecraft. He's got to make that arduous journey over the adapter and back into the hatch. Well, he finally gets back into the spacecraft, and he's got that extremely long tether that he's attached to. Now, that's all piled into the spacecraft in the footwell. And the footwell was only so deep, and this uh, tether took up the whole footwell. So when Gino finally gets into the seat getting ready to repressurize his knees are about in his chin both of them and he's jackknifed over now i don't know if you've ever experienced deep severe muscle cramps but that's what he was suffering in his legs and Ooh. his arms now these are not cramps that you get getting out of your car these are cramps sustained cramps that can last for as long as 20 25 minutes to 30 yeah. minutes and I've experienced them, and my wife will I tell have too. my wife will tell you that I have hit notes that opera singers haven't picked <laughs> up. They are terribly, terribly painful. They don't go. You just have to wait them out. Yeah. And this is what Gino's going through. Is he's wow. Jack in those into metal the, pants? In, in those metal pants that are, like oh. I say, a rusty uh, suit of armor. They finally get the hatch closed, and Gino is completely doubled over. And he tells Safford, he says, Tom, if we don't repressurize the spacecraft, I am going to die. They finally get the spacecraft repressurized. They get Gino's helmet and gloves off. And Tom said he's red as a beet. So he takes that spray gun and he sprays water on his face to, to cool him down. Wow. And um, they landed that same day, incidentally. And you'll see in this upcoming picture of Cernan that he is still showing the effects of that terrible... Uh, ordeal that he went through in that spacecraft as they were repressurizing. Here's Tom in the left seat. This gives you a good idea as to how tight these quarters are. The window is right in your face. The window's not going anywhere. But here you can see Tom. He's got his neck dam deployed and he's using uh, uh, cooling inside the, uh, the suit. And here's Gino and you can see his face is still red mm. and he looks like he has been through uh, a terrible wrestling match. Uh, uh, he is still, you know, just coming to grips with that whole thing. You see, again, his neck dam is deployed using the cooling system. And by the way, one of the problems that we had on that spacewalk, one of the contributing factors, was the fact that we just used ambient air for cooling. We didn't even have high flow rate on those. You just turned on the flow, and that's all you had. We didn't have the mm. LCVGs, the liquid-cooled ventilation garments that we take for granted on EVAs now to keep you cool. Right. Um, again, this was, I think, a point in the program where management, trainers, and astronauts had perhaps gone a bridge too far. Now, it's understandable that you want to make as much progress as possible in a short as time as possible, but I really don't think enough thought was given to the consequences of these things that we were trying to do. All of it was being done too soon and too quickly. Um, this, this was not the point of arrogance that we'd come to by the time of Apollo 1, but it was certainly a point of overconfidence. Overconfidence of the unknown, and just wanted to point out that this this a year after Ed White's spacewalk. Mm -hmm. This was only the the uh, GT8 was canceled because of the emergency. Mm -hmm. That was the only spacewalk planned after GT4. Yeah. Five and six uh, were endurance missions, of course, and seven the rendezvous. Uh, so eight was uh, the next spacewalk that didn't happen mm -hmm. when uh, uh, seven orbits uh, Armstrong. And Scott had returned emergency. And you're mentioning the unknowns. In flight tests, there are three things you have to concern yourself with. <clears throat> the knowns, the unknowns, and the unknowns that you don't know about. Right. Sometimes called the unknown unknowns, 
our pilots call them the unk unks. Unk there unks. are pl plenty of those on Gemini 9, and I don't think, I think because of the rush of the schedule, uh, the desire to press on to make uh, Kennedy's deadline, um, I think people their reach exceeded their grasp. Unk unks, that's yeah. interesting there. Yeah, great observation there by Nick Thomas, uh, uh, who's definitely, uh, I value your opinion. Then we had after this mission, Gemini 10 was Mike Collins' spacewalk. Mm -hmm. Then we had Gordon Cooper on 11. Or Dick Gordon. And, I mean, Dick Gordon. Yeah, <laughs> Dick Gordon, thank you. Uh, which, yeah, they, they didn't go so well either. I mean, no, they, they had the problems too. Uh, and then it finally took Buzz Aldrin's Gemini 12, where they yeah. started practicing in a water tank. Yeah, yeah. Now, they didn't do that with uh, no, CERN. No, they, and, didn't, and, they didn't start doing that until uh, Gemini 12. And to, to kind of buff off the edges of the historical record, the decision to use a water tank was from many, many corners of management in the training team. It was not necessarily the idea of one man. It's right. Like to yeah, yeah. Put out we, we give credit to uh, Ed yeah. White a lot of, of having the bulb that went off. But and, we do we do give credit to Buzz Aldrin, who trained and understood the uh, necessity for handholds and tethers and so mm -hmm. forth and brought his talents to bear on that whole process. So it was a team effort. It was mm -hmm. a team accomplishment. And you certainly have talked to the great story Musgrave, yeah. the EVA for the Hubble. Mm -hmm. When I talked to him, he was all about, it was like a ballet. Mm -hmm. Like an, uh, you had to know where your left foot, your right hand, your right foot, everything was going to be mm -hmm. like a ballerina on stage. You well, had to have complete control of your body. Story took as his exemplar, uh, Dorothy Hamill, the ice skater. And he told me, he said, when Dorothy's doing a triple axel, She's not thinking about the gold medal. She's not thinking about the Olympic party afterward. She's thinking about getting that blade flat square on the ice. And Story calls that perfection in the moment. And that's what you strive for on an EVA. You got to stay ahead of your, of your task. Uh, at the same time, focus on what you're doing. And it is, it is mentally exhausting as well as physically exhausting. It just, it, yeah, mentally exhausting. Yeah. Over 200 astronauts have spacewalked, or two, uh, both mm -hmm. Russian and uh, Chinese, mm -hmm. more, making more than 700 individual spacewalks. Uh, since 1998, the start of the ISS, 263 spacewalks have been performed. And we talk about the difficulties of the EVA on Gemini 9, but it's also important to remember that these were necessary learning steps. We had to be confronted with these difficulties so we could plan around them and, and, and make our success uh, uh, more achievable, shall we say. But this was a learning process, and you, you learn from your failures. Mm -hmm. You learn from your failures. We learned Absolutely. a lot here, yeah. but um, it was um, it was a tough mission. It was certainly not a failure. It was simply another step in the learning curve. Absolutely, absolutely. After the exhilaration <clears throat> a year earlier yeah. of Ed White's spacewalk, here we had truly lucky to get this man back alive. And we learned what spacewalking and EVA was all about on this flight and wouldn't really come to a solution until Jiminy, Jiminy 12. Here's a splashdown of 12. Now, Gino writes about this in his book and said it was a very comfortable splashdown, no problem. But as I look at this picture, I see a Volkswagen hitting a concrete wall at 50 miles an hour. He skid across the road. Right. Yeah, yeah, I can't yeah. believe what it must have been like inside that spacecraft. But huh. Gino said it was no problem. <laughs> And uh, one parachute too. I yeah. always, I always, I always, I always get that man. Just one yeah, chance to, to come down there. Now here we have the crew get uh, opening the hatches. Now they waited until the spacecraft was pulled up on the aircraft carrier before they got out. The green but dye it, was traditional. The green traditional marker uh, dye marker, but uh, it was a matter of the fact that that spacecraft was too hot and too close, and you want to get those uh, hatches open and get the crew some good fresh sea air, which I think, again, must have felt exhilarating after uh, three days up in orbit. What great friends. And they flew again together, Apollo mm -hmm. 10, 
uh, the uh, barnstorm in the moon of yeah. the uh, uh, without landing, uh, and then remained friends. And, uh, and uh, Cernan Cernan did a very good Apollo kind of documentary there at the end of his life. Well, you was... know, it's it's interesting to see as in any enterprise, but particularly in in test flight. <laughs> Uh, if you do a good job for your commander, he's going to sponsor you. He's going to take care of your mm. career. Now, that was true of Wally Schirra for Tom Stafford. It was true of Tom Stafford for Gene Cernan. It was true for of Gus Grissom for John Young. I mean, if your guy did good, you were going to you were going to be his sponsor. And uh, uh, Gino went on to a very successful career. But in terms of sponsorship having spoken to John Blaha about this, Tom Stafford has been responsible for the success of more careers in aviation than anyone will ever know. Wow. Uh, and quite often, and, and more often than not, it's, it's done quietly and unobtrusively. John Blaha tried out for the class of 78 and he didn't get in. Tom Stafford said, try again for the next selection. And John got chosen. Huh. So, you know, hats off to General Stafford, not oh, only yes. as far as a, an engineer and test pilot, but a man who, like General George Marshall, could see true talent and move it along the pipeline. And then what did General Stafford do when he retired as a, a NASA astronaut? He went out to Edwards Air Force Base and ran it for another mm -hmm. decade oh, as, yeah. as, the, as the general of that facility out mm -hmm. there. So, right. yeah, you got to see his space museum west of Oklahoma City. Uh, it is phenomenal. It's 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 my best Neil Armstrong Museum and him are tied as far as the private ones in my I, mind. I oh. had a conversation with General Stafford several years ago and we were talking specifically about Gemini 9 because we have the capsule on display at the visitors complex. And I told him, I said, yeah, I show people the capsule. I show them the center of pressure and I tell them that you made the most accurate splashdown of all the Gemini missions. And he looked at me and he said, the most accurate of the Mercury, Gemini, or Apollo programs. <laughs> and from that point, he started to quote bank angles, reverse bank angles, oh, really? lift vectors. He Did... literally reflew that reentry for me. And uh, yeah, how can you how can you just compare a, a, an experience? Like yeah, that? Uh, yeah, right, right. No, that is amazing. That is amazing. When I would, when I got an autograph from him five years ago when you're at the space center there, I said, "Sir, I've been to your space your uh, facility four times." He grabbed a napkin. And he, he asked me, he says, "Did they move the the T thirty eight and all that when you when last time we were there?" I said, I "Said yes, sir." And then he grabbed a napkin and started showing me where they were going to put things in there. And I'm like, uh, "Don't you have something else to do?" Attent but he loves his museum. Attentive to every detail. And when I told my wife that story about the the reflying of the Gemini nine reentry, she said, "Well, who is Tom Stafford?" I said, Tom Stafford is a man who should have landed on the moon and come back home several times. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this wonderful conversation here we've been having with Nick Thomas. Doug Forrest is just 10 miles outside a jet propulsion lab ah. in L.A. Cynthia Rossi, you know Cynthia out there at the Space Center. Dave Stangy's watching up in Michigan. Gary Gerald. Gary Gerald keeps our peanut butter jars full of, he's a peanut <laughs> farmer up there. I eat peanut butter almost every day. I love it. Good man. Uh, Robert Law is in Dundee, Scotland. <clears throat> Mr. Chris Cowley, we are hoping that we get enough votes in for you to get Gino on that beer can. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Whiting, uh, Go Green. Uh, Carlton's watching. Tammy uh, Miller. Yeah, Tammy How Miller. about a few shout outs there for? Shout out to Tammy. And also, let's see who else we have here. Craig Donaldson. That's that's the vice right. mayor there, Williamsville. Hazel Banks, yep. Nasser Sheik, Biobot, uh, Keith Sowell. He's in Arkansas. Arkansas okay. okay. Uh, Lisa De La Porta, uh, Sarah Lopez, Cliff Watson. He's in Pomona, Australia. Gave us the uh, hundred stars. That's about ten show. bucks in money there. Thank, Thank you. you. Well done. Uh, let's see Christopher Mick, uh, Tribu. Cultura. Um, the yeah. Tribe of Cultural Astronomy, I think oh. that's probably... Okay. Uh, we are going to work on your handwriting, Mark. <laughs> and uh, finally, uh, O.S. Walker. 
Yeah. And I would like to put a shout out to some of my friends who will be seeing this presentation. Uh, Ken Cameron to uh, let's see, uh, Wendy Lawrence. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, my Marine Corps buddy, Terry Wilkett. Oh, yeah, Terry. Uh, Bob Springer. Hoorah. Hoorah. Two, two Marines there, Springer. Yeah. And... Simplify. And, uh, of course, John McBride, John Blaha. And uh, all the men and women I've been privileged to work with and uh, make friends with over the years, God bless you. Yep. Well, thank you for watching our humble Stay Curious program here. We're so happy to have have a lot of a lot of wonderful people like Nick Thomas. We've got Terry White, yep. the manager of the OPFs, will be here next week. Uh, Mikey Haddad, uh, a level four payload uh, specialist, uh, does a program with us, and and we are going to get more visit more ramped up here with guests for you because we know you love them up there. Nick, we got just a, maybe another slide or two to show here. Huh? We wanted to show our beautiful tribute to these Gemini astronauts mm -hmm. at our Gemini monument. There's a gorgeous uh, Florida day, the two in the beautiful background. Beautiful symbol on the pedestal there. Just That's gorgeous. right. Groundbreaking for this was in July 96, and we dedicated it November 97, 26 years ago. Don't know if I have another image. Oh, there oh, we go. Oh, yeah, there it is. There's That's person. one of my, I took yeah. that photo a while back. You can see the VAB. In the background. Right, right over the, right, right over, just to the right there. And those are names of space workers that yep. gave us $100 to support our museum efforts to immortalize you as a space worker. And I would love some of the places I work to say, send me a hundred bucks and we'll put your name on the, the Newsweek building on Madison Avenue where I work. <laughs> and it also commemorates the continuum of exploration uh, leading up to space station and going as far back as Columbus. Absolutely. Because it's all the same thing. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, uh, and there is the yeah. pavers that we have. <laughs> the, the, this uh, mission there, those are important part of our history there. And, uh, oh, we do have this on here, so I'm going to go out with this. So why have I got Pinocchio there? Always let your conscience be your guide. And you and I watched this on Walt Disney, at least I think you did. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pinocchio uh, was a uh, uh, Jiminy the Cricket there. Jiminy Cricket. And Jiminy Cricket... Let me see. I don't think I have any more. Oh, well, well Jiminy Cricket had a, a um, When You Wish Upon a Star was a yeah, beautiful a song. song that sure, just, uh, and, and When You Wish Upon a Star as Dreamers Do. And, and uh, Nick, we've, been, we've got a lot of dreamers in this rocket renaissance going on today. Well, I will tell you, we have a lot of dreamers and we have a lot of doers because a dream without action is just a fantasy. So when you combine the dreamer and the doer, you get one powerful force that makes things possible from flying in space to landing on the moon to returning to the moon in a couple of years. Well, absolutely. And these dreams are anchored into realities mm -hmm. paved by such missions like Gemini 4 and 9, like we mentioned all the over uh, 700 individual spacewalks have now been ha happened. I think uh, was uh, CERN's like the thir fourth or fifth one. Uh, in see. history, something like uh, that. Let's see, we had Alexei Leonov, and then we had Ed White, and then we went to Gino. So Gino was the third. third. I didn't know uh, if the Russians snuck another uh, one in no, there. After after the flight of Alexei Leonov, they stayed quiet until 1968. Wow, that's mm -hmm. right. That's right. Uh, in fact, absolutely, <laughs> uh, not, I doubt you, but the anomaly that you pointed out there that, that is crazy during the two years of the Gemini 10 flights, virtually every six weeks, Russia flew no missions mm -hmm. until the fatal Vostok, uh, Va, uh, Soyuz, uh, one, Soyuz mission. one mission. Soyuz one mission. Yeah, that and killed they, Komarov. <clears throat> they had also suffered the loss of their chief designer, Sergei yep. Korolev. Yep. And the uh, general put in charge of the program after that was simply not up to the task. Uh, in addition, Brezhnev was not a proponent of the space program like Khrushchev had been. So there were a lot of things underlying the slowdown of the Soviet program in the 65, 66 uh, time frame. Yeah, we, we were lucky. There was a lot of things, stars that lined up for us. Yeah, so I, to think speak. So. And, I think so. I think so. And we're going to end with this. Of course, we've been saying Gemini. All right. 
Gemini this, Gemini that. Well, NASA actually in 1965 said hey, that is the correct pronunciation. All right, and I got my little cheat sheet here to print that out. I wanted to say that the uh, doesn't matter. <laughs> the uh, one of the the American College Dictionary says uh, either way, Gemini or Gemini. No, the American College Dictionary wanted Gemini, like the constellation Gemini. And the Webster's Collegiate Dictionary said either way. But NASA, as you well know, said it's Gemini, like, I mean, it's Gemini, like Gemini Cricket. Mm -hmm. well, like the story. And that's why I wanted to show Gemini Cricket there. And from, from my own experience, all the Gemini uh, veterans that I've spoken to have used that pronunciation. But perhaps the most important to me is that that's the way Gus Grissom said it. So that's settled. <laughs> that's settled right there. Well, we thank you, Marty, for a great Streamlabs job today. We mm -hmm. wanted to tell everybody this is your last day to put Gino on a beer can there at Two Roads Brewing. Uh, I voted today. Chris Kelly, our artist, did this masterpiece oh, yeah. uh, painting there. Uh, and uh, we hope that, uh, well, Chris is leading it right now. We're going to pick the top five, and then maybe we'll be voting again. But it's been okay. fun to do this for yeah, him and great. for Gene Cernan, too. Yeah, absolutely. Tell you there. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Marty, thank you. There you are with your friends there. Thank you, Marty, for a good Streamlabs show today. Uh, and uh, we want to thank you, the American Space Museum, for taking your time to watch today's episode. We hope you tell your friends about the special guests and programs we have to offer. And we can promise you, stay curious. We'll always strive to bring you space history like no one else, like the stories you heard today from Nick Thomas. You told me three or four things I never, I didn't know about. And I think the most, the coolest is the metal pants that Gino yeah. was wearing on there. I never, ever heard about that. So we appreciate you a lot, my yeah, friend. Thank and you. Uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you out at the Space Center, wrangling those astronauts out there. You got a lot of your friends lined up, I see, for the summertime mm -hmm. here. So we are glad that everyone's with us today. And until then, I'm Mark Marquette saying I can't wait to see you again to bridge the space between us.